What does it take both physically and mentally to absolutely demolish the Tour Divide? And by demolish, I mean riding it in 12 days, 12 hours, and 21 minutes, which is faster than anyone has ever done, while at the same time prioritizing sleep and recovery more than any of the preceding speediest riders. I thought it might be fun to tackle this question in a video. For those of you out there with aspirations of riding the divide super fast, or even if you're slow and simply in awe like me, this video will give you an idea of the criteria you've got to hit to be the fastest. I'll dive into the power data and other key metrics and stats from Lachlan Morton's inspiring trip down the spine of the continent. I'll also compare it to Mike Hall's 2013 and 2016 rides, as well as Ulrich Bartolomeu's 2023 Grand Apart winning ride. Ulrich, if you're watching this, I hope I didn't butcher your name. Anywho, all of this should give us some legitimate insight into how the heck Lachlan rode the 2,700-ish mile route more than one day and 10 hours faster than Mike Hall did on his own mind-blowing record-setting journey in 2016. This was Mike Hall's third attempt, and his time of 13 days, 22 hours, and 51 minutes is still the official record. Ulrich's time of 14 days, 3 hours, and 23 minutes was set on his rookie attempt, and at just four and a half days slower than the record, it's the second fastest official time to date. By the way, if you're new to this channel, thanks for tuning in. I'm Alan, aka Dirty Teeth, and if you've been here before, welcome back. It's great to see you. Before I dig in, I want to be completely clear about two things. Number one, my sources. I gathered satellite tracking data from track leaders and follow my challenge. And most of my other info has been collected from various reliable sources on the internet. As we know, satellite trackers only ping every five or 10 minutes and sometimes go through areas of dodgy reception. We also know to take everything we read on the web with a grain of salt. I've done my best to ensure the accuracy of my research and my interpretation of the data, but I'm still in no way claiming this as an official study. It's more of an exercise in geeky bikepack racing curiosity, so cut me some slack. With that said, I'm primarily using actual Strava files uploaded directly from cycling computers whenever possible, which is much more accurate than spot trackers or inreaches, etc. Second, I'm not here to stir up debate over FKTs or official route records. I'm sick of all the toxic armchair quarterback drama. Should film crews be deemed support? Should Mike Hall's official record still stand? Should Lachlan's ride have an asterisk? I don't care. Oh, but Lachlan bypassed Coco Claims, or what about that fire detour over there, or this route change or deviation over here? Those arguments have been beaten to death in the bikepacking circles, and it's such a waste of energy. No matter how you chop it up, Lachlan's ride is extremely motivating on multiple levels, and I just want to keep it all positive and give some respect where massive respect is due. With that said, it's clear when you take an objective look at the data available. Lachlan Morton pedaled the route faster than anyone ever has, and probably faster than anyone else will do for a good long time. And he did it on his first try. Mike Hall wrote a time of 19 days, 8 hours, and 47 minutes when he first attempted the Tour Divide in 2011, and this was five years before setting his long-standing record. Granted, there's so much more route information and planning aids and splits to study these days but there's really no substitute for course knowledge and experience. So the fact that Lachlan and Ulrich for that matter, both rode so well their first times out was extra impressive. Anywho, Lachlan dealt with the gamut of his own TD setbacks just like everyone else experiences. Fire detours, trench foot, saddle sores, stomach problems, peanut butter mud, freezing rain, scorching heat, fried brake pads and a rotor, and a busted derailleur for the last 600 miles and subsequent knee pains from single speeding and hard gears. He lost his rain pants, he lost his sunglasses, and plenty of other issues, just like everybody else does. Although we strive for it, there is no such thing as the elusive perfect ride or perfectly clean run. And that's part of the fun. Lucky for us, Lachlan and his team have been completely transparent about his effort and his goals from the get-go. His story is beautifully and articulately documented in the film made by his brother Angus called The Divide. I highly recommend watching it if you haven't already, and I'll put the link below. I saw it during a Zone 2 ride on the indoor trainer, and before I knew it, my workout was almost over. It's that good. When you watch the movie, it is kind of hard to get the true sense of what an amazing accomplishment Lachlan's ride actually was. He's so laid back and nonchalant and seemingly unfazed by the massive effort. Even though you know he has to be absolutely wrecked on the inside at times, it just doesn't show on the outside. But when you take a gander at the numbers, it's mind-boggling, bordering on superhuman. 
Speaking of numbers, another good faith act of openness is that Lachlan publicly posted his Tour Divide ride on his Strava account, including his power output. In a time where much of this info is oftentimes guarded by the elite riders, it's admirable and what prompted me to make this video. So a quick little background on Lachlan. He was born just after New Year's on January 2nd, 1992 in Port Macquarie, Australia. This makes him 31 years old at the time of his one and only divide ride to date. For comparison, Mike Hall was 35 years old on his record ride in 2016, and Ulrich was 36 when he won the GD in 2023. Lachlan had a successful career as a world tour road cyclist, but always had a passion for adventure and ultra distance cycling. In December of 2013, he and his brother Angus rode 2500k, or 1600 miles, from their home in Port Macquarie to Uluru. Uluru has a special place in my heart because I climbed it when I was like 10 or 11 years old when I was visiting the Red Center with my dad. It's a pretty cool and special place. I don't even think you're allowed to climb it anymore. They documented the journey in a film called Thereabouts, which has become kind of like a cult classic. It has the vibe of an indie 80s flick, and if you're into spoon collecting or have ever made out with an old Portuguese lady in a dive bar, it's a must watch. If you know, you know. Thereabouts actually wound up becoming a trilogy, also tracking rides in the Colorado Rockies and Columbia. And you're in luck because all three films happen to be right here on YouTube and I've got links in the description. Side note, I just finished watching the one in Columbia and I think it was my favorite because it kind of reminded me of my time on The Buried Life when I was shooting documentaries a while back. My favorite part is when they meet up with this guy who has one leg He's literally got a prosthetic and he's riding a mountain bike and he's actually kicking Lachlan and Angus's butts up this steep road climb. And they're just looking at each other like completely humbled. Anyway, check it out if you get the chance. Okay, sorry for that bunny trail. More recently, Lachlan's been using the bike to raise money for charity. In 2021, Lachlan did the Alt Tour in which he raised $700,000 for World Bicycle Relief. He rode every stage of the Tour de France, including the transfers unsupported. And he still beat the Peloton to Paris by five days. In early 2022, he rode over a thousand kilometers in just 42 hours from Munich to the Polish-Ukrainian border and raised over $250,000 for Ukrainian refugees. Later that year, he shattered the Colorado trail race record, finishing in a mere three days, 10 hours, and 15 minutes while raising money for the family of his friend Sule, who had recently passed away. In a nutshell, Lachlan's a guy with a giving heart, he's a pro tour caliber rider, and he's primarily racing the Lifetime Grand Prix series these days while chasing alternative adventures every chance he gets. So with the years of racing and training for Grand Tours and adventuring on the side, Lachlan obviously has a massive engine and pedigree for going fast and holding pace for long periods of time. But he's also proven he's got the mental fortitude and the passion for bikepacking that's required to go super deep day after day. And it's this combo platter of physical and mental attributes that separates the best from the rest in this self-supported style of racing. Switching gears, Lachlan wasn't even traveling like a weight weenie on the divide. Especially when you compare his bike and his gear list to other top-notch racers, his setup was pretty lavish. For example, he had a whopping 47 liters of storage capacity between all of his bags, including two 10 liter panniers and a 20 liter rear rack bag. This was surprising to many, including myself, and at first glance it doesn't appear to be too aerodynamically efficient. His setup looks more like a touring rig than a svelte race rocket. His Cannondale scalpel was set up with 640 millimeter flat bars, inner bar ends, and aero bars, as well as a 100 millimeter lefty Ocho suspension fork. He had a 5.5 liter maximum water capacity, loads of room for extra food, and did not cut corners with any of his gear. On the electronic side, he opted out of a dynamo hub and instead carried two Phoenix BCR 26R lights and a small headlamp. He also brought two large cache batteries, one with 26,000 and one with 20,000 milliamp hour capacity. And he even carried a spare Wahoo GPS unit. Lachlan carried a cozy 5 degree or negative 15 C sleeping bag and a legitimate bivy with a pole, not just some emergency mylar sweat bag. He also brought plenty of clothing, including a spare set of bibs. He carried a robust toolkit and first aid kit as well, and had tire inserts inside his Vittoria Mezcal 235 tires. Even with the heavy load, he was still able to rock a 38 tooth chainring up front, 
on his one by Eagle drivetrain with a 1052 cassette in the back. The important takeaway here is that Lachlan didn't have some kind of magical bike setup or ultra minimalist, ultra light kit to help him go fast. He didn't skimp one bit. To the contrary, he opted for creature comforts and even brought an eye mask, which aligned with his sleep strategy. The common approach for those at the front of the Tour Divide is to go pretty heavy into sleep deprivation. However, Lachlan chose a different plan. Before the race, he set a goal to be completely stopped for 12 hours out of every 48 hours, with the hope of averaging nearly six hours of sleep per night. Obviously, that has to ebb and flow with passing through towns and resupply opportunities, so some days required more or less time on the bike. Overall, the stats showed he did a pretty good job of sticking to his strategy, and when you look at his power output, one can assume that the extra rest helped him deliver a consistent and strong pedaling effort day in and day out, instead of just zombieing through portions of the ride in a completely diminished and inefficient state. Numbers don't lie, and in this case, they tell a mind-blowing story. Lachlan left the YWCA in Banff, Canada on August 29th, 2023 at 9 a.m. and officially started the route at 9.03 a.m. He arrived at the border station in Antelope Wells at 9.24 p.m. on September 10th for an official finish time of 12 days, 12 hours, and 21 minutes. To be clear, that's how long it took him to ride close to 2,700 miles or 4,345 kilometers with an estimated 170,000 feet or 52,000 meters of elevation gain while heading southbound along the Continental Divide. That's an average of around 215 miles or 345 kilometers and 13,600 feet or 4,145 meters of climbing per day for 12 and a half days straight. <sighs> that is insane. <laughs> According to Lachlan's Strava files, he had a total moving time of right around 190 hours or just under eight days, 7.92 to be exact, of actual riding during the 12 and a half days or 300 total hours he was out on the route. This is also assuming his head unit was always recording whenever he was moving. According to his Follow My Challenge tracker, he was moving for 209.7 hours or eight days and almost 18 hours. Again, take these stats with a grain of salt. So going by Strava, that equates to an average of about 15 hours and 12 minutes actually on the bike turning pedals per 24 hour period. Or if you're going by Follow My Challenge, that would be moving 16 hours and 48 minutes every 24 hours. On the other side of that, according to Strava, this means he was averaging eight hours and 48 minutes of cumulative stop time per 24 hours. And if you're going by Follow My Challenge, that number would drop to seven hours and 12 minutes. Framed another way, Lachlan spent 63.3% of his time moving and 36.7% stopped per Strava, or 70% moving and 30% stopped per Follow My Challenge. I know this is a lot to digest and we can't guarantee the accuracy of either. My guess is it was somewhere in between the two. With that said, it's impossible to know how much sleep he was getting during the roughly seven to nine hours he was stopped on average each day, but Lachlan stopped and started his Wahoo at the beginning and end of each main riding session. So he has 13 separate files uploaded to Strava and each one has an elapsed time and a moving time recorded. From this, we learn that he averaged 16 hours and 48 minutes of elapsed time per riding session. And during these long sessions, he was only stopped for an average of one hour and 24 minutes. Again, that's a stop time of less than an hour and a half out of almost 17 hours of riding on average. This is pretty insightful since it shows how efficient he was with his downtime throughout the day. This is usually the time taken for self-care, snacking, going to the bathroom, filtering water, resupplying, bike maintenance, and all that kind of stuff. Maybe there was a little cat napping involved, but probably not much. With that stop time factored in, we're looking at about a 5.8 to 7.4 hour window once he stopped for the night. So it is very plausible that he did make his goal of averaging around six hours of sleep per night. But it's not just the quantity of sleep, it's also the quality. And after watching the documentary and studying his GPX tracks, it appears Lachlan only bivvied out two nights. Give me a quick sec, my mouth is dry. 
Once early on, he slept outside on some grass in or near Lincoln, Montana, and another time towards the end when he camped at the Beaverhead Ranger Station in the Gila section of New Mexico. It seems the rest of the time, he slumbered in the comfort of motel rooms, lodges, and a converted Airstream or two. Not only does this aid in the quality of sleep, it also lets you get out of the elements, take a shower, dry out your clothes, recharge electronics, tend to yourself, and all the other intangibles that aid in efficiency. Especially when they're first floor rooms directly on route that you can just roll your bike right into and out of. There's a lot to be said about having a nice warm real bed to crawl into versus a damp sleeping bag. Now let's see how some of Lachlan's stats stack up to Mike Hall and Ulrich Bartolomos. This is where it becomes clear that no matter how you slice it, regardless of fire detours, alternate routes, or hunkering down in an outhouse for 10 hours, Lachlan just moves more efficiently than everybody else. This is gonna be a mouthful, so bear with me. His average of 214 miles per day was 20 more than Mike Hall's 194 miles per day in 2016, and 24 more than Ulrich's 190 miles per day average when he won the GD in 2023. Lachlan achieved this by having a 13.27 mile per hour average moving speed, and this was according to his Wahoo Element roam data updated to Strava. For reference, the info from his tracker on Follow My Challenged, although likely less accurate, had it at 12.25 miles per hour. And although I couldn't find a Strava file for his 2016 record ride, track leader shows him with a 10.4 mile per hour average, but he also spent many more hours on the bike and was definitely more sleep deprived that year, which I'll dive into more in a minute. Track leaders has Ulrich with a 10.4 mile an hour moving average and his Strava file uploaded from his Garmin 1040 has him at 9.6 miles per hour. By every measure at my disposal, it's crystal clear that Lachlan's average moving speed is higher than everyone else. It may not seem like much, but just one mile an hour stretched out over a couple hundred miles of ride time easily adds up to 200 miles or more over the course of this race, which equates to a full day even for the fastest folks. The higher speed allows Lachlan more time for rest and sleep and adequate refueling, which also means more recovery, which also allows him to keep his efforts higher day after day, which equates to a recipe for success. Now let's compare moving time versus stop time. Lachlan spent 66.3 of his total time moving in 2016. Mike Hall spent 76% of his time moving and Ulrich had a 76.25% moving average, almost identical to Mike Hall. That means for every 24 hour period, Mike and Ulrich were moving for an average of 18 hours and 15 minutes, which is a crazy feat in its own right. But that only leaves five hours and 45 minutes total to be off the bike each day. So after dealing with resupply, self-care, bike care, and all that stuff, it doesn't leave much time to sneak in some sleep. For argument's sake, let's say they matched Lachlan's impressive 1.4 hours of average downtime per riding session. That still leaves them with barely four hours of potential sleep time per day. I remind you, Lachlan was spending less than 17 hours per day on the bike, and realistically, according to his Wahoo, more like 15 to 15 and a half or 16 hours. So the takeaway is this, not only did Lachlan average a couple more hours of sleep per day, but that's also a couple hours per day that he was not on the bike pedaling. Over the course of the race, that's more than 24 hours of sleep and recovery that Lachlan had, which Mike and Ulrich did not. So we've discussed in depth how Lachlan smashed the Tour Divide. Duh, it's a no brainer, Alan. He pedaled his bike really fast. Ride, rinse, repeat. But how did he ride his bike so fast? Or to ask it in another way, what type of sustained effort was necessary for Lachlan to maintain his blazing pace throughout the ride? These stats have not been confirmed by Lachlan himself, but it is the best I could get by scouring the internet, so let's go with it. His height is listed at 5 feet 11 inches or 1.8 meters. I've seen his weight logged between 137 and 139 pounds or roughly between 62 and 63 kilograms. And his functional threshold power or FTP was reported to be 330 watts in a 2022 article by Pro Cycling UK. 330 watts is also displayed as his FTP on Lachlan's Strava account. Assuming that's correct, Lachlan would have a power to weight ratio of approximately 5.2 or 5.3 watts per kilo. 
Luckily, Lachlan used a Quark power meter during the tour divide. So with the sauce plug-in for Strava, I have some accurate power and cadence metrics for you. Although I should mention his power meter died about 60 miles from the finish line, so no power or cadence data for that last bit. Regardless, the following info should prove eye-opening to anyone remotely thinking about taking a stab at Lachlan's time. If you're curious, there was no heart rate data provided on Strava, and he didn't appear to wear a strap. Lachlan's average power over the 12.5 day ride was 166 watts, and he maintained a normalized power of 184 watts. Assuming a 330 watt FTP, this puts his normalized power at around 55% of his FTP, which is traditionally the lower end of zone two or the endurance zone. For what it's worth, Ulrich's power data from his Garmin 1040 shows an average power of 154 watts during his ride and an MP of 191 watts with a listed FTP of 323. So maybe he's pushing slightly more power on the climbs and coasting a little longer on the descents. It's hard to hypothesize and I don't know what Ulrich weighs, but it seems like he's probably a little bit heavier than Lachlan, although he's listed at 5 foot 11, so they're the same height. Anyways, just figured I'd throw that in there. During the ride, Lachlan had a peak one hour power of 222 watts, and surprisingly, he achieved this deep into the race on day nine while traveling from Silverthorne to Sargent's in Colorado. His highest peak three hour power was 212 watts, and this was accomplished on day one between Banff and Fernie. Overall, it's no surprise that Lachlan's highest power was delivered during the first couple of days with 190 watt average on day one and two, and a normalized power of 210 and 201 on days one and two. During the last couple of days, his average power dropped to about 150, and his normalized power to around 175. This is still nothing to sneeze at with that much fatigue and stress already in the legs. Speaking of stress, I've got some TSS data for you. If you're not familiar with TSS, it stands for Training Stress Score, and it measures how much stress is put on the body based on the intensity and duration of the ride. In general, the higher the score, the higher your fatigue. And if you're involved with structured training, these numbers will mean something. Otherwise, it's gibberish, so don't worry, I'll fly through it quickly. The total TSS of Lachlan's ride was 5,785, with an average TSS score of 463 per day. His highest TSS score was a whopping 638, and it came on day two while traveling from Fernie to Whitefish, Montana. I found Lachlan's cadence metrics to be pretty interesting as well. With his road background, I assumed he might push a higher cadence in the 85 to 90 range, but not so. He averaged 68 RPMs throughout the whole race, and it didn't vary much day over day, regardless of how much or how steep the climbing was. He kept it at a 75 RPM average on the first day, but after that, it dropped. The only other anomaly was during the last couple of days when Lachlan was dealing with a broken derailleur and found himself single speeding. He was averaging only 56 RPMs after the mechanical when he was forced to pedal in his hardest cog. Then it bumped up to 62 RPMs when he figured out a way to wedge his spare spoke in the frame and get it to a slightly easier gear. There's also no doubt that riding with this low and strenuous cadence contributed to his knee pain at the end of the race as well. Anywho, if it wasn't for this mishap, his cadence would have remained consistent at around 69 to 70. Ulrich's average cadence was 70 RPMs, so pretty much dead even with Lachlan. In terms of energy expenditure, Lachlan spent 112,408 kilojoules in total while pedaling his bike. To break it down even further, that's an average of 8,993 kilojoules per day, or average of 592 kilojoules every hour that he was riding. If you don't speak kilojoule, it simply means that while he was creating power to the pedals on his bike, Lachlan burned around 107,464 calories. This equates to burning around 8,600 calories per day, or 566 calories per hour. That's about 40 Snickers bars a day's worth of calories, and it doesn't even include the time hiking his bike, or time off the bike, or his basal or resting metabolism either. Another way to look at it is he lost about 31 pounds worth of calories throughout the whole ride, or an average of 2.5 pounds a day. So how did Lachlan replace the crazy amount of calories he was burning day in and day out? All I have to go off here is what I spied during his documentary. 
This included gallons of milk and chocolate milk, milkshakes, french fries, ramen, Coors Light beer. <laughs> I find it pretty funny that he drank light beer. Uh, I saw Coke, Fanta, coffee, pickles, biscotti, family-sized packs of Oreos, a variety of candy bars, and I'm sure that's just the tip of the iceberg. So yeah, he pretty much refueled like everybody else does on the divide, shoveling in anything and everything he could to keep the furnace burning. By the way, I'll slip in a shameless plug for my Tour Divide gas station food video. You might enjoy it, just saying, I'll put the link below. If you're inclined, you can go through Lachlan's Strava files and check out how fast he rode different sections and what KOMs he might have picked up along the way. I'll leave that to you, but I did want to finish up with a few observations I found interesting and worth sharing. Lachlan had seven days where he rode 200 miles or more. This includes his longest day in terms of distance covered, which was 288 miles on day 12, traveling from Cuba, New Mexico to the Beaverhead Ranger Station in the Gila. This also happened to be his longest day in the saddle with an elapsed time of 21 hours and 27 minutes and a moving time of 19 hours and 30 minutes. Lachlan had three days where he climbed over 17,000 feet the toughest of which was gaining 17,759 feet over 188 miles riding from Lincoln to Wise River, Montana on day four. His easiest day was day 11, which makes sense because it was right before his hardest day. Traveling from Platoro to Cuba, New Mexico, he only rode 57 miles and climbed 4,222 feet with an elapsed time of four hours and 40 minutes and a moving time of four hours and 21 minutes. The hottest temps his Wahoo recorded were on the last two days in New Mexico, registering 102 degrees Fahrenheit near the Poco Loco airstrip after Grants on day 12, and 106 degrees Fahrenheit on the tarmac leaving Hachita as he was heading into the border at Antelope Wells. His lowest recorded temp was below freezing at 30 degrees Fahrenheit on day four before dropping into Helena, Montana. Whoosh! Oh, I've got to be honest, I'm exhausted and all talked out. I really hope you found some interesting nuggets in this video because I sure had a bunch of fun researching and making it. If this is something you'd like to see more of, let me know. Especially if there's specific athletes or events or FKTs you want to see me do a deep dive on, I'm all ears. Links to all my references and resources and all that jazz are below. So yeah, please help out by sharing this video on Facebook giving it a like, and if you have any questions or anything at all to add to the conversation, don't be shy, leave a comment. As always, I appreciate you hanging out till the end, and until next time, ride bikes, give back, pay it forward. Thanks so much for squeezing dirty teeth into your busy schedule. Please help us reach more people and ensure you receive new videos by giving this video a like, subscribing to the channel, and clicking the notification bell. Until next time, ride bikes, give back, pay it forward.